dang it. Let's take some time and talk about the Jaguar V12 valve train. Now what you see here is the major components that are uh, employed to enable the engine to breathe properly. And what you see right here, this long skinny thing is called a camshaft and these bumps are called cam lobes. These cam lobes have a very specific profile to them that not only causes them to open and close the valves but also um, it causes them to open and close in a very controlled way to give the engine its, uh, its breathing characteristics. The job of the cam is to open one of these. And you can see that on the camshaft there's a number of these lobes, two of them dedicated to each cylinder. And what you've got is an exhaust valve, which is what this one is right here, and an intake valve in each cylinder. Now the valve consists of a stem, this long skinny part right here, and you can see that there is a very finely ground surface on the bottom side. Okay, this actually fits into this seat. The seat does not have its surface ground on it yet, but it goes together like that. And the valve opens and closes, in this case, to allow exhaust gas out and then to seal the combustion chamber. Right. <clears throat> now you can't just have this valve just kind of floating around. You've got to actually be able to, when the cam isn't pushing on the valve, you've got to be able to pull that valve shut. And that's what the job is of this spring that fits between the valve and the cylinder head. The spring is held on by something called a retainer. Now if you look carefully at the retainer, you can see that in the middle there is a tapered surface. Now that tapered surface is uh, the place where these little things right here, the keepers, live. And the keepers are, together they form a conical structure. But if you take them apart, you can see that there is a ridge around the inside. That ridge fits in that groove in the valve stem. And when you got them both in like that, you can see that there's that cone shape that fits into the, the valve spring retainer. That's how the valve springs are retained on the, uh, on the end of the stem, okay? Now, there's a, uh, a process that's really, really important. That's called valve clearance, valve to tap at clearance adjustment. Now what I've got here is a drawing that corresponds to the various parts that we've already discussed, but slightly larger scale so that we can hopefully get a clear picture of what I'm talking about here. You can see that we've got the valve here. The red thing is the retainer. The green things are the keepers. The black thing is this cam follower that actually is driven by the cam down against the valve, like this. This rides in a bore in the cam box. This purple thing that you see in between the stem of the valve and the, the tappet is a shim. And that's what a shim looks like. It's a round disc of steel that fits in this recess in the valve spring retainer. And so this is how everything goes together. Okay? Now, <clears throat> this is where things can go really bad. Let me set these things down here. The issue is that we have to have a certain amount of clearance in between the back side of the the cam lobe and this tappet. The reason for that is that if you've got too much clearance, this does a lot more clattering and banging than it really needs to. It's not good for the parts. Uh, but the worst scenario is that if this clearance is too small. And if that clearance is too small, what happens is the engine warms up, is all these parts get bigger. And if 
these parts get big enough to the point where that gap disappears, now we got a problem down here. And the problem down here is that this valve has to be closed for two reasons. Number one, to seal the cylinder. Number two, to pass heat off to the seat just for that instant that it's closed. Uh, it doesn't seem like it actually be closed long enough to do any cooling, but you gotta remember that it's, it's closing hundreds of times per minute, thousands of times per minute. So it needs to be closed for that purpose. If it doesn't close all the way, it can't get rid of the heat, and that valve is going to burn. Now, if you're thinking about rebuilding your engine, this is really, really important. This thing up here, that part of your engine is critical. The problem arises when you take your cylinder head in to have it overhauled, and what they do is just simply grind the seat and grind the face of the valve without any regard to how much material they're removing. The problem is that when you renew the surface, on the face of the valve, that finely ground surface, and also the seat. Due to the fact that you remove material, the valve fits up farther into the cylinder head. And what that means is that this valve pushes on the shim, the shim pushes on the tappet, and this gap, this clearance closes. And again, that's got to be at the, you know between 10 and 14 thousandths of an inch. And what happens is somehow you've got to reduce or increase that clearance back to its original. Now, what the manufacturer does is provides shims of different thickness. So it's not a problem. All you gotta do is figure out what dimension shim you need, send away for them, put them in, you got your correct clearance. The problem is that there's only about a 25,000 seven inch range from the thickest to the thinnest shim. As this material gets removed more and more down here, you need thinner and thinner shims. What happens if you can't get thin enough shims? Well, one thing you could do, which is what many people do, and I don't really see a big problem with that as long as you don't reduce the thickness of the shim to half its size. Uh, you could conceivably see these things break if you were to do that. But a few thousandths off of a shim is not going to be a big deal. The problem arises when you start grinding the end of that valve stem off in order to open up the clearance. Problem with that is the end of that valve stem is hardened. And if you grind the end of it, you're gonna remove that hardening. Jaguar absolutely forbids you grinding the end of those valve stems. Now, I've had some knowledgeable people say that you can remove a few thousands and it won't be an issue. The, the hardened surface is, is thicker than just a few thousands of an inch. But when asked, okay, so how much can be removed? I've never been able to get a good solid answer. So the end of that valve stem, best be left alone. <coughs> The other issue that can arise, uh, now what happens if you remove that, that hardening? What happens is the, the end of that valve starts to get hammered. And eventually you can get to the point where instead of that shim resting on the end of that valve stem, it's actually nesting in the bottom of this pocket here that it fits in the retainer in. And what happens then? This joint between the keeper and the retainer starts to chatter, and eventually something in this area right here is going to fail. And when that fails, the valve drops down into the combustion chamber, and nothing good happens. So, <clears throat> what are your options? If you find that you can't, that you've got, you got to find a lot of clearance someplace. Well, you don't have a lot of options. You can get new valves. In extreme cases, you're, you can replace the valve and the valve seat and re renew it to its original specification. The key being the correct amount of valve stem height um, that the valve sticks out of the top of the cylinder head. Another thing you could actually do, 
and this isn't why you would do it, but you could actually get a high performance reground camshaft, which basically what they do is using the same cam profile, they reduce the diameter of the base circle and keep the same dimension above the center line in order to produce more lift. What that does, being they reduce the diameter of the base circle, is provides more clearance in between the tappet and the cam. Now, if you've got a normal situation here, what you can do is you can get thicker shims in order to accommodate that. But in the case where you've got some hammy-handed uh, technician that is just merely ground all your uh, valve face and seat material away, um, what that does is enables you to use stock shims. Now let's turn our attention to valve guides. Now a valve guide is the part of the engine that guides the valve. And what that means is that it's got to make sure that the valve moves back and forth as it's acted on, either directly or indirectly by the cam, and make sure that it, it stays concentric with the valve seat. Okay, the valve face right here, has to be has to fall right on the valve seat. Now the valve guide looks like this. Now this is made of cast iron, which is a good material. Uh, it's durable. It transfers heat well. In fact, when most engines in the United States were made out of cast iron, all they really did in a lot of cases is just drilled holes in the head for the valves to ride in. And it was only after those wore out that they had to consider something like what we have here. Um, cast iron, as I said, is uh, durable, transfers heat well, and it's inexpensive, and, uh, and they're available in a wide variety of sizes, and there's even different formulations of these. Works very, very well. Uh, the other option here, and this is what you have available for Jaguar V12s, is a bronze insert. Basically the same layout, different size, of course, and there's many, many different formulations of bronze. Um, you can't just take a bar of brass and, you know, make a set of these in your shop. They're, it's a very specific bronze material. Uh, it's reasonably durable, not as good as cast iron in that regard, but it's, it's real uh, claim to fame is the fact that it, it transfers heat very, very well. And for that reason, high performance engines often will use bronze valve guides. Uh, now, the issue with these, if you need to replace them is, uh, you gotta have a, a press, you've gotta have something that ideally, you'd have something that you could heat the, heat the cylinder head up so that it'll expand a little bit and allow you to press, press it out of the head and same thing when you press the new ones in. Uh, a process that I've become familiar with just recently is that of the K-line process. And this is a K-line valve liner. Now that's K-L-I-N-E. And what you do with this thing is, first of all, you buy yourself a thousand dollar box of stuff. You ream out the original guide. This one, for example, to the right size for this. You use a special driver with your pneumatic air hammer, drive this in. You then shear off the top and the bottom with a special tool, dress it up with a countersink, which is what I do, although it's not necessary. And then you size with a, what's called a ball, uh, a ball reamer. You, uh, you size the inside to the diameter that you need for the valve you've got. Now this sounds like kind of a quick and dirty way to uh, recondition a valve guide. And it is quick, and it is inexpensive. But the fact is that if you follow the adventures of Harry Musgrave in Harry's garage, you will note lately that he's had the engine on his Lamborghini Espada overhauled by a man named Ian Tyrrell. And Ian Tyrrell, uh, runs a high-level shop in the UK, and he uses the K-Line valve liner process. And as it turns out, many, many top-tier shops throughout Europe and the United States use this process. So that's why we use it. So there you are, quick and dirty uh, course on, on valve guides. And if you like these videos, subscribe.
that's critical because that's uh, how we're going to get to the point where we can actually make money at this stuff and, you know, do more things. And like us, and we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicle.